OK, a couple things here at the start. First, I'll remind you again, there won't be any class this Friday, two days from today. I won't be here, so you shouldn't be. Well, don't be here either. You can come and sit and talk to each other if you like. Sorry about that, but it is. Um, the other thing, second thing is, is the second problem set was, was just due just now. Collab Alas is very limited in what it can do. And I can't allow you to, to answer the questions more than once, you know, make more than one attempt, and have feedback turned on in any form. It, otherwise, it gives, back the, gives you the answers before the second attempt, and that's that. So I'm, I can't give extensions. There are a whole lot of things I can't do. I don't know. I, I, it's one of those, I don't understand this, this arrangement, but it is what it is. I'm trying to bring up my own independent homework site. Um, it's a work in progress. I'm pretty close. If I can get it going, uh, time, time. Uh, I, I can do, it can do everything I want, but I've got a few, there are a few hitches still. So hopefully I'll get that going. In any case, uh, be aware that, I, that I, I don't like how it's functioning right now, where I can only give you one, one, one shot, no feedback. Ugh. I will, however, turn on feedback after class today, so that you should be able to go, assuming it works the way I think it works. I can't see it as a student. I can only see it as, a, as a, the instructor, which is different, and, and there's nothing I can do. Um, anyway, I will, I will try to turn the feedback on so that you can see what answers were right and what were wrong. One of the issues that came up is that it, it covered material that's in the book that I hadn't gotten to in class. That is, a, that is an occasional problem where I, where I think I'll be here when I assign the homework, and I'm not quite there. So I apologize for that, too. Uh, the secret is, finally, the homeworks turn out to be a relatively small influence on your grade. I know you guys, uh, have, society forces you to, to think grades are tremendously, tremendously important. And it, that's, it's a, it's a strange situation. They aren't actually that meaningful. They're important, but, but there's a lot of uh, people looking into them, reading tea leaves. This person has a 3.625 as opposed to a 3.626. Obviously, the one with the, with the one one thousandth of a grade point higher is a, is a far superior person in every respect. It's just such nonsense. Um, grades are noisy as can be. We're, physicists talk about noise. Scientists talk about noise. It's just, just random fluctuations and meaningless stuff. And there's just huge amounts of random fluctuations. All right, I could go on harangues like that for, for the rest of the class, and you might not mind, but uh, let me get back to material. So the topic of, at hand is, is, is bumper cars. So hopefully you've all ridden bumper cars. And you know that they have these weird arrangements where you get your car going, and it hits another car, and the other car goes flying off, and you come to a stop, and a car hits you at a glancing angle, and you start spinning, all sorts of things. What's happening during all those collisions is the exchange of, in particular, three conserved quantities uh, simultaneously. You can, carry, you can carry multiple conserved quantities with you. There's no problem. You can simultaneously carry energy. You can carry momentum. I I'm doing it right now. I've got energy because I'm moving. I've got momentum to the right because I'm heading to the right. And if I spin, I can carry the third conserved quantity. Actually, I carry it anyway, whether I've got none of it or not. Uh, angular moment, momentum. So the bumper cars during the collisions are passing along uh, portions of each of these conserved quantities. Energy gets conveyed one way or the other. Uh, momentum gets conveyed. Angular momentum gets co conveyed. And, and th that transfer, those transfers of these conserved quantities uh, significantly influence the motion after the collision. They have to obey. The, the motion before the collision has to obey conservation of these three quantities. And after, it has to convey uh, conservation. And they, they can't, during the collision, make some more of one of them or get rid of one of the other ones. And so how, how things, collisions are just con controlled by conserved quantities. All right, so I've, I've talked about momentum. Long, back, long ago, of course, I talked about energy. Momentum is this conserved quantity of moving, of going somewhere. So to, to start heading to the right, 
I can't do it until something gives me rightward momentum. I can get it out of the wall. I can get it from one of you coming up and pushing me. I can get it from the floor by way of a frictional force like this. You know, I'm now moving to the right. Where did I get the rightward momentum from? I got it out of the floor with friction, end of story, by giving it leftward momentum. It, it responded by giving me rightward momentum. We didn't create any momentum out of anywhere. Just the, the floor ended up with it that way. I ended up with it this way. Your questions about momentum. I do want to reiterate the idea that you can get, you can transfer more momentum than you had by, that's a little bit vague statement, but if I get some rightward momentum out of the floor, I got it, here, I'm carrying it along with me. I can give it to the wall. In fact, I can give the wall more rightward momentum than I have, and look what happens. I gave it twice as much rightward momentum as I had. I went from having a positive amount of rightward momentum to a negative amount of rightward momentum, which is leftward momentum. With any of the vector quantities, if you have a positive amount, then of course the quantity is going in the direction of its official direction. So a positive amount of rightward momentum. If I end up with a negative, negative amount of rightward momentum, it just, it's just a negative amount to the right, which is a positive amount to the left. It, it it's, shouldn't be terribly mysterious, but it's useful. Um, what this, you know, where, did, where would that ever ma matter? If you want to transfer a whole lot of rightward momentum to that wall, you might think that all you can possibly transfer to it is what you're carrying. Here we go, I, all I can give it is, is my current momentum. You can actually do better. You can transfer all your rightward momentum and then extra. And why, where would that be a consequence? Suppose you're trying to knock something down, you know, bang, 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 I, you know, let me in, let me in, I, I, I only want to talk. Um, if you want to knock the door down, yeah, now I'll get in trouble. Um, you know, you can go, you can hit it and give it all your momentum. But you can actually do better. You can hit it, boom, and bounce. And when you bounce back, you give it extra momentum. And that may, consequently, may, may affect the door more, knock something over. And I'll ask you questions like this. You know, finally, you know, one of my favorite test questions is, you go to the, the fair, and, and the goal is to knock over those really heavy jugs sitting on the shelf. And you've got a bunch of objects to throw at it. You want to knock them off. And if you do, you win this great big huge prize that falls apart tomorrow and spills little styrofoam beads all over your apartment. OK. You want to knock the jug over. Well, basically you want to convey to it as much momentum, energy's involved too, but you really want to give it as much momentum as possible so it just like flies off the shelf. Don't throw the bean bag at it, because the bean bag will hit and give all its momentum and then drop. You can do better. Get the bouncy ball. That same mass, you throw it the same way. It goes in there like the bean bag, full of momentum to the right. Same as the bean bag, but unlike the bean bag, it doesn't just transfer all of its momentum to the jug. You can do better. It kicks back. And in the act of bouncing back, it transfers still more momentum to the jug and knocks it over. Can you follow that idea? So, so battering ram type things. Put a bouncy tip at it. It comes back and it gives more momentum during the, during the rebound. All right. So I think I've sort of done momentum itself adequately. Uh, the, the, in the context of the bumper cars, they're, they're pushing and, and bouncing, uh, transferring momentum. A little, a little bumper car hitting a big bumper car, little being little mass, big, bu big bumper car being big mass. The little bumper car can actually give the big bumper car more momentum than it had, and it, it, it will. Uh, just just to, to illustrate, these, you know, these are my bumper cars. This is the bumper car air hockey table. And if this is your car, and this is a car you're going to hit, and you have the same mass, the motion is transferred really quite beautifully from this one basically comes to a stop. If I, I got to hit head on, of course. I have to aim and talk at the same time, doesn't work. Okay? Amazingly, this one pretty much transfers its entire motion to the, to the red one. How did that happen? 
it requires that these be very bouncy, which, which is another issue we'll come to with bouncing balls. But they basically, the, the green one was able to convey to the red one all of its energy and all of its momentum. And so the red one continued on as though it were the green one. And that happens in bumper cars where you're going along and you hit somebody in a car just like you, same mass, all that. Yeah? What happens if the red one weighed more? If we make it, I don't, can't go any higher in weight, but I can make the, I can make the, uh, I can make the, I'll make a green one big, and this is not, this is you. You're gonna go into a freight train, okay? Watch what happens. You bounced back. The problem here is, you, the, the red one can't give all of its energy and all of its forward momentum to, to the green one because the green one can't carry the same mix of energy and, for, and uh, forward momentum. Because its mass is different, if it were heading forward at the same speed as the little guy, it would carry with it, oh gosh, it would never travel at the same speed. But if it tried to carry all, the, all this guy's momentum, it would travel too slowly to carry much energy. If it tried to carry all of this one's energy, it would travel too fast to carry the right amount of momentum. Momentum and energy have different relationships with speed and, and velocity. And if I try to think them through in front of you, I'll mess them up or take forever. So they can't, this one can't convey perfectly all of its momentum and all its energy. That's, that's really the most important detail. What does it do instead? It gives it a, a reasonable amount of energy and more momentum than it had in the forward direction. And that's why it ended up with backward momentum. So a little thing hitting a big thing tends to bounce back as part of the bounce. It's unable to, it, it's trying to give the, the proper mix, but it fails. It gives, it, it's trying to desperately to give enough energy, and in the process, it, it overshoots on the, on the momentum, and it actually goes backwards in, instead. And if you balance them badly the, wrong, the other way, the big guy hits the little guy, the big guy keeps on going to some extent. Again, it's unable to give it all of its energy and all of its forward momentum. Instead, it gives, it's trying to, yes, trying to give, it, it, it falls short on giving all of its forward momentum. It ends up keeping some with itself. The right, just enough mix that it keeps on moving a little bit. And, and these are sort of intuitive. You, you've watched things hit. When you're driving along in a car, and you hit a bug, it doesn't happen that, that the car stops and the bug continues on. The car, the car just swats the bug forward. The bug does get a certain dose of energy and momentum, but, but the car retains most of it. Is that, is that doing OK? Other questions like this? So those transfers uh, really influence air hockey, bumper cars. Um, I mean, the details of, of the mismatches, eh, we could spend a lot of time on them, and you know, you, you, we would if it were a conventional class, but it's not, it's not so crucial. Uh, most games involve the perfect transfer. Billiards and pool, there's a reason why all the balls are pretty much identical and very bouncy, because then they really can do that transfer process beautifully. If you played pool with a mishmash of big balls and little balls, it would be, um, it, it would be a really complicated game because the you, predicting where things would go would be like crazy hard. Okay. Impulses. The, the, so so when you're moving along, you're carrying the conserved quantity of moving along, namely moment, momentum. You're not carrying force. Okay. So that's one of these. I, you know, I've beat on you already with that. Um, there's this gut thing that oh, I'm carrying so much force. I'm going really fast. Nope. You're carrying the conserved quantity, momentum. It's when you touch things, hit things, then the forces show up. Forces are involved not in the carrying, they are in the transfer. And the transfer is by way of these things known as impulses. Just to give it a name, it's, a, it's a, to do an impulse on something. It's an awkward word, but it's, it is what it is. You convey momentum by exerting a force on something else for a period of time, and since there's sort of no limit on, you know, time is time. It, you, you've always got it around, passing by at least. You can always convey momentum to things. I can convey momentum to the wall. 
even though the wall doesn't move. All I have to do is push on it, and as time passes, I'm conveying momentum to it. I may make no progress, you know, like, okay, so here I am. I'm, I'm conveying, my hand is truly conveying momentum to the wall, in, momentum toward the right to the wall. Nothing much is happening. How come? Because that momentum, rightward momentum, is conveyed to the whole earth, coming through my shoes, and the ground is pushing me toward the wall. I'm pushing toward the wall, the ground's pushing me toward the wall by, what, by my shoes. And it's giving me back the momentum I keep giving to the wall. If you take one of these things out of the story, like if, I, if I'm no longer able to push on the wall, woo, over I go, right? Suddenly that, that rightward momentum begins to accumulate in me. Can, can, you, can you picture the whole circuit? It's sort of like a circuit. The momentum's going, it's all to the right, around and around for me, in my hand, into my feet into my hand, into my feet, into my hand. Well, if you take one of them, one of those, if you break the loop, like this, oh, I mean, I'm too scared to do it, because if I just did it properly, I would simply fall over smoothly. I can't do it. Um, you, you all can try. If you break the circuit, I start to accumulate it. And I mean, other examples of this, same arrangement. Gravity is pulling down on me, steadily, steadily. It's giving me downward momentum, right? It's exerting a force on me, the, the Earth. Downward force on me, time's going by. But nothing's happening. Why? It's because gravity gives me downward momentum, and I give the chair downward momentum, because I'm pushing it down. And it, in turn, pushes the floor down, and the floor pushes the whole Earth down, and it's just going in a circuit again, right? Can, can you picture this? Four questions. If you take, if you break the circuit by pulling a chair out from under me, gravity will still put momentum into me, and I won't have anything to give it to. What's going to happen to me? Yeah. Um, it, it'll accumulate in me, and I'll fall. So, is this is this a great way of looking at everything in the world? Yeah, maybe not, but, but, it, but it, it, it's meaningful, it, it, it's real. Okay, transfers of momentum by way of impulses. You, you sort of force on it, and time goes by, you then convey momentum. Yeah, Dakota? So, so the, Dakota's question is, is, is when I'm sitting on the chair, and. Gravity is giving me momentum, and I'm giving the chair, and the chair is giving it. Is there any momentum really here? It really is working its way through the system over and over. There's no net accumulation anywhere in the system. So you never see it. And so you could, you could go, and it's sort of like a tree falls in the forest you know, to make a sound. Um, it, it's, it's real, but you never see it in this context until you break the circuit. So take the chair out from under me. Remove the floor from under the chair. Now the chair and I will both accumulate downward momentum. We're both in trouble. Um, an airplane, when an airplane's flying along, we'll deal with airplanes pretty soon. An airplane is flying along level, level, level. Gravity's pouring downward momentum into it. Where's that momentum going? It really is. It's pulling the plane down. And time is going by. That's an impulse. Where's the momentum going from the, from the plane? You tell me. What's between my hands? It's called an airplane, right? It's not, not it goes into the air. The plane, the plane as, it, as it zips by, is pushing down on the air to give away its momentum so it doesn't accumulate any. If it did, it would come down. So, so an airplane holds itself aloft by throwing the air down. And you may not notice this with airplanes because you're rarely underneath them as they go by. But helicopters, you watch hel helicopters, same story. It's a little you know, trivially different. You know, all the people going, all the TV shows, the helicopters there, they're all, they're all going like this because they're being blown downward like crazy and, and it looks good. Um, that, the air is just rushing downward as the, as the helicopter is throwing the air down, trying to, to get rid of the momentum that, that the Earth gives it. Is that doing OK? Yeah.
Yes. Okay. Um, the, the momentum is transferred by way of a, of a force for time. So you can think of this as the whole circuit right now. It's gravity pulls down on me, giving me a downward momentum. I give downward momentum to the chair by pushing down on it. That's where the force is. The chair pushes down on the floor and gives momentum to the floor. The floor pushes down on the building. The building pushes down on the earth. And that seems like the end of the story until the, the, earth, and the, well, the, earth, the earth then responds by pulling down on me, and, and, and the, we, we recycle. You can do the reverse. I am personally pulling up on the earth by way of gravity. Uh, that, that may be a strange way of looking at things. Um, when I, you, you, you've seen that, I'm thinking of the Le Petit Prince, the, 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 the book, the St. Uxbury book of, 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 the, of the little kids standing on the little planet. The planet is gravitationally pulling on the kid. The kid is gravitationally pulling on the planet. It, it's both ways of looking at it are right. Anyhow, I can go, I'll stop that story. Here I am, I'm pulling up on the Earth with a force, and that force happens to be equal in amount to my weight, and it's upward. So I'm doing an upward, I'm, I'm transferring upward momentum to the Earth. It, it's real, I, I mean, I, some of this is like brain expanding. Wow, okay? Um, so, so I am pulling up on the Earth, it's, it's for real, and that, therefore giving it upward momentum. It in turn is conveying, and if, that, if it accumulated that upward momentum, it would begin to move upward faster and faster. Still trivial amount of speed, but it would in principle be going up. Well, it doesn't. Why? Because it then pushes up on my chair with the help of the building and gives, me the, gives my chair the momentum, which in turn pushes up on me and gives me the upward momentum, and then I give it back to the Earth by way of gravity. It, the, circuit, the circuit basically goes both ways. It's all, it all works out symmetrically. Is that okay? Yeah, Lucy? Is there a defined relationship between support force and momentum? No, support force is, is, a, is one of many forces that can, that can convey momentum. Any force will do. Any force acting on you will transfer momentum to you in the direction of that force. And the amount of momentum it will give you is, is, the, is the force itself times time. Is that, is that doing it? Okay. Ah, the two forces. Okay, the question I think is, is, is to look at both, both sides of the transfer. Remember, energy was conserved because if I do work on the bowling ball, it does an exactly the same amount of negative work on me. That works exactly the same for, for momentum. If I give momentum, ah, pick something. I, I pushed on that, that chair and gave it rightward momentum. You all okay with that? I exerted a rightward force on it for a certain amount of time and gave it rightward momentum. It, it, it because of Newton's third law, exerted a leftward force on me for exactly, the, you know, equal in amount to the, to the left for the same amount of time. It gave me the same amount of leftward momentum. So I gave it 16 units of rightward momentum. It, took, it gave me 16 units of leftward momentum. Sum to zero. It, 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 it conveyed, no momentum was created or destroyed in this. It was moved perfectly from me to the chair. Is that helpful? Same thing was going on in this, this seat thing. I mean, maybe the seat, the, the seat story and the, and the complete flow is just kind of me off on a, on a tangent. Um, in general, things hitting things, they convey momentum. One of them gets the momentum, to, to say, to, say, to your right. The other one loses exactly that amount of momentum to the right. That's how, that, that is ultimately why momentum is conserved, or, or it's, it's, yeah. There are even deeper reasons why it's conserved. But that's, I'll save that story, I'll bite my tongue. Other questions? Where, what I did want to make sure was, was conveyed to you is, is that, that you, can, you can transfer the same amount of momentum. I did this last time, but I'll do it anyway. Same amount of momentum, say, to the wall with a large force for a short time or a, sh or a small force for a long time or anything in between. It's the product of the two that matters. Okay? 
uh, a little piece of sort of low-hanging fruit that I keep forgetting to finish is I can convey momentum to the wall, no problem, because I can exert a force on it and time can go by. What's hard to convey to the wall is energy, because it won't move. So I can push on it, but it won't move a distance in the direction of my force. So conveying energy to the wall is, tr is hard, maybe not even, you know, sort of not possible, because it won't move. I can't do work on it, but I can do an impulse on it. So in general, things have an easier time transferring momentum than they have transferring energy. Questions about that, that one? OK, but, but, but uh, back to this. this tra in, in transferring momentum, which you can always do, because there's always time as opposed to distance, not always. In transferring momentum, you can do it with different relationships between force and distance. Ah, force and time. And that's crucial to, 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 to collisions. Hitting something that is very hard. You're walking along in the night. Oh, I know there's some Kit Kat somewhere. You know, where's the ball of Skittles? <laughs> right? You care what you run into. If you run into something, the, the steel post that, that is supporting the, the, the upper floors, you're in trouble because you will transfer thunk. You will transfer all your forward momentum to that post in a hundredth of a second, a thousandth of a second, by way of a big force for a short time, as opposed to watering through and you walk into your friend's beanbag chair. <laughs> you know, it, it slowly takes the momentum out of you. Big time, little force. So that's why we go through life really trying to avoid sudden transfers of momentum. They all hurt. Collisions in cars, same idea. Spread out the collision in time so that you lower the force involved. Cars now crumple when, during impact deliberately to, to prolong the impact. Make it as, 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 uh, yeah, as long as possible in time so it's as small as possible in force. Any questions? There are, there are a thousand examples of this. You'll see some on the exam. All right. Um, Enough about momentum then. So momentum transfers are all important. Um, also, there's a, there, okay, so that brings us to, to a second and very important conserved quantity, namely angular momentum. It's the rotational analog of, of ordinary momentum. It's the conserved quantity of spinning. And um, yeah, why it's, you know, it, it, momentum, the conservation of momentum is what underlies Newton's first law of translational motion. The, why, why, why does, what, where's the origin of inertia? Why do things keep doing what they were doing? It's because in the absence of a force, they can't transfer momentum. And therefore, whatever momentum they have, they keep. They keep moving. So the, the, the reason behind Newton's first law of, of translational motion is the conservation of momentum. Similarly, the, th the, second, the first law of rotational motion says an object that's rotating and it's got some special some words in there like rigid and not wobbling. An object that's rotating and it's free of torques has to keep rotating. And where's that from? It's because there's another conserved quantity associated with rotation that once you've got it, you can't get rid of it. So if you've got no torques acting on you, you, you you're stuck. You've got a certain amount of this conserved quantity, and you will keep rotating until you can transfer it. So to show you that this is around, and it, and it's called angular momentum. So by getting on this swivel chair, which has a pretty good bearing, remember roller bearings, ball bearings, the, the, no sliding friction to waste energy, this, this sort of decouples me from the earth pretty well. It's not perfect. Good enough. And as a result, right now I'm sitting on it, and in one direction of rotation, obviously I can't do somersaults here, but in this direction of rotation, that is about, the, about a vertical axis, I'm pretty free. And since I have no, I'm not rotating, I've got no angular velocity around that axis, I have no angular momentum. Angular momentum is going to be related to, to angular velocity. And as a result, I can't start spinning spontaneously. I'm getting a little bit of rotation here just because the bearings aren't perfect. But the, the idea is that, that, that right now I've got zero angular momentum and I can't make this stuff. So until, until I, something gives me angular momentum, I'm drifting. Uh, until something gives me angular momentum, I can't start turning. 
So where am I going to get some angular momentum from? It's transferred by way of <laughs> angular impulses. And what's an angular impulse? It is still, it's the influence of rotation times time. And the influence of rotation is not a force, it's a torque. So if something uh, exerts a torque on me for a period of time, I'm going to accumulate angular momentum out of it. And until I can transfer that angular momentum, I'm going to have it. Well, I could have one of you guys come up here and give me a spin, but I'm going to actually, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to, I'm going to twist the earth with my shoe, and the, the earth is going to twist back. That's a Newton's third law thing. It's, it's the Newton's thir third law of rotation, which I may never have mentioned. If you twist something, it twists you back equally hard in the opposite direction. So I'm going to twist the ground one way, and it's going to twist me back. Ready? Get set. Twist. OK. So now I've got angular momentum. It happens to be, like all rotational vector quantities, following the right-hand rule, my angular momentum is upward. And I've got to just keep turning, because I got the stuff. And until I give it to somebody else or something else, I keep turning. I'm, it's stuck. OK? I'm getting tired of it. I'm going to give it, I'll give it to the floor. I can't reach anything else. So I, so I gave it to the floor by way of another torque. I did another angular impulse on the floor in the opposite direction and stopped. OK? Yeah? Does the same thing apply for rolling? Yeah. Yes. If I could roll, um, yeah, stop, things have trouble stopping any sort of rolling. A uh, bicycle, bicycle wheel. Yeah, if I get a wheel rolling, and, and, and whether I sp get it started, here, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll just roll up there. I did a torque on it. I did it with a, by using a force exerted with a lever arm from the center. I got it spinning. It can't stop until I give the torque, until it does a, a transfer to something. And if I let it roll, and this is complicated. This is like right out of your problem set, right? Off it goes. Um, the ground briefly tried to stop the rotation with, by way of friction, but it, it failed to get all the angular momentum out of this. It, it retains some. And once it's rolling, it, it, can, it can go along pretty much forever. Um, we'll talk later about how it manages to stay up. A bicycle wheel has this, and any rolling thing, the coins you drop out of your pocket have this amazing ability to roll and stay rolling on their edge. If you just plop this on its edge, it falls over, of course. But if you roll it, it stays up. And we'll see that that's an that's interesting effect that shows up in bicycles. But is this, am, I, am I OK with? So angular momentum can, can, can occur about any, any axis, things that, are, things that are rotating. And there's a pivot issue. Angular momentum is always measured around some, around some point, some center. And the typical center for most of the stories we'll ever deal with is the center of mass of whatever object we're talking about. So the bowling ball will have an have a, have a angular momentum about its own center of mass. This wheel has mo angular momentum about its own center of mass, many other such things. All right? So, uh, so it's a conserved quantity. It's invested in something by way of an angular impulse. It is subsequently taken out of that thing by way of an angular impulse. There are what I consider great examples of, of angular momentum. Uh, over the past couple of decades, there have been uh, satellites launched into space by, that, that have involved human crews, you know, the space shuttle and su such, to, to, to deliver them, to play with them years later. And so, and so there have been satellites where they, they put the satellite up there, and it was some like a, a big giant Coke can, soda can, ro uh, spinning along its long axis. They, they often use, use rotation. Uh, to, to, to create uh, more stability in, the, in it for, for reasons we don't need to go into. But anyway, they'll spin it, and they'll, they'll, they'll put it up there spinning, and they'll come back years later, and it is still spinning about the same axis in space because they put angular momentum into it when they, when they launched the thing, and no one has exerted torque on them since, and it's still there. So, so angular momentum can just stick around in some freely spinning object for, for years because it's conserved, okay? Transfers of angular momentum, just to, to, to show you them, I mean, the obvious thing is to have somebody come up and twist, twist me on that swivel chair back and forth, but I can do better, which is to spin this wheel up. And this is, 
the demonstration I'm going to do now, OK, I could have somebody do it. I'm getting lazy right now. It's too life is too complicated at the moment. So I'm going to put angular momentum into this thing with the help of a motor and a buffer wheel. It just grip, it's, easy, it's using friction to get the, the wheel going. And the wheel is going pretty fast. And actually, this isn't a normal bicycle wheel. The, the tire isn't full of air. It's actually full of metal. So this wheel has a big rotational mass. And it's angular momentum. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Yes, this is not a, not a uh, uh, demonstration for someone with short arms. OK, so right now, the, the wheel has angular momentum vertically. Uh, it's actually around a horizontal axis. It's, this, it's that direction. I'm going to rotate it so, the, so its angular momentum is, is upward. You'll notice my angular momentum is downward right now. Now my angular momentum is upward while it's is downward. What I'm doing is I'm exchanging angular momentum with it. And our net angular momentum is zero. But I can distribute it funny. Right now its angular momentum is downward, mine is upward. Now its, now it's angular momentum is upward and mine is downward. And we're back. And what you can't see is how hard we are twisting each other when I flip it. You have to feel that for yourself. There's a huge angular impulse between the two of us. It's, it's giving me its angular momentum one way, and I'm, I'm taking it out, and vice versa. And overall, we have none. And if I could do this in space, we could do it about all the axes. Because I'm on the Earth, I have to do it about only one axis. And it's still got angular momentum along with energy. And to get the angular momentum and energy out of it, I use sliding friction on the floor. OK? This one, you know, try this one. If, you're, if you can bear not looking at your cell phone for 10 minutes, come on, I'll try it. Just to rearrange my tie here. <laughs> Caught in a spinning wheel. <laughs> Isadora Duncan on, uh, on dry land. All right. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, the key thing here is the angular impulse. It's just torque times time. It's the, it's the rotational analog of, of the ordinary impulse. OK, what I wanted to, to go after is when you're just cruising along, free of forces, you're carrying a certain amount of momentum with you in the direction you're, you're heading. And since your mass cannot change, your velocity cannot change. Motion is very simple. The constant velocity of Newton's third law, first law of translational motion, comes about because you can't change your mass. You're carrying a certain amount of momentum. If nothing pushes on you, you're going to keep moving steadily at constant momentum, which brings with it constant velocity. If your mass could change, things would be different. But your mass can't change. It mass is your mass. It's the, me it's the measure of your inertia. What about ro the rotational world here? Remember, ro the rotational Newton's first law of motion is complicated. It's got rigid and it only applies to rigid objects. Well, that comes about because if an object's not rigid, it can change its rotational mass by changing its shape. If it does that, Things go a little nuts with um, the, 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 uh, the, the angular velocity. Do I have a, this on the slide? What I want to show you is this. The, the, the last line here. Suppose you're a completely free object. Nothing's touching. No torques. Then your angular momentum is fixed. So the left side of that equation at the bottom, angular momentum, is fixed. You're a satellite out there in deep space communing with nothing, OK? Turning. Hell, you know, I can feel it. But I, oh, the movie's gotten too old in my head. It's probably, you know, you guys think of it as probably as a, as a it, it had sound. It was, it was black and white uh, pre-talky. No, 2001 Space Odyssey. 2001 is long past. OK, um, anyway, there you are, deep space rotating away. The left side of the equation is constant. That means that the product of your rotational mass times your angular velocity is constant. But you can change your rotational mass by changing your shape. 
for example, go from this to this. If you do that, your rotational mass shrinks. But the left side of the equation is constant. So in order, the right side of the equation has to be constant too. So if you shrink your rotational mass, what happens to your angular velocity? It increases. And that's the, I did this for you, what, last time, I guess. So I've got no angular momentum right now. I have to get some. I'll get it out of the earth with my foot. Whoosh, now I've got it. So my angular momentum is on board. It's trapped in me. I can't change it. But what I can do is reduce my rotational mass and, as a result, increase my angular velocity. So the product of my rotational mass and my angular velocity hasn't changed. That's how this, the skater trick works. It, the skater is carrying a certain amount of angular momentum obtained during the, the last moments of his or her moves. And while spinning, the skater then, I'll stop, shrinks his or her rotational mass and consequently experiences an increase in angular velocity to compensate so that they have a, a, the same angular momentum. Questions about that, that idea? Yeah. Can't, you can't? Uh, can't be hidden. The, 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 the conserved quantities of moving and rotating, this, there's no potential form. So you can't, unlike energy, energy is not about moving, it's about doing. So you can hide energy, you, you, my, my, my crazy can with the snake in it. it. It has more energy when the snake is squished than unsquished, but you don't notice it until you sort of like look. Whereas if you've got momentum to the right, I mean, short of, of, of decorating you in a black tarpaulin, big one, we, you, you've got it. You can't, there's no potential form of it to, to make it invisible. You, you, a, a box containing rightward momentum is going to start moving to the right, if not right now, pretty soon. Is that okay? Same with rotation. You can't hide, hide the rotation. It's, it, the, the, it's directly connected with the motion. Other questions? So, so that's the rotational mass can change. This story here, I, and I asked you this and you all got it right, and that's, that's when I did that demonstration. If you're on a merry-go-round of something that's spinning and you, and you go in toward the center, you will shrink its rotational mass by virtue of being, putting your own personal mass closer to the center. And that means it, it, its rotational mass goes down, its angular momentum has to stay constant. For that to happen, the angular velocity has to increase. Okay, so this question, which, which is relevant primarily to, well, it was relevant to the problem set, but it is what it is. We've all seen, or I've, I, I've tried to show you, that objects accelerate in response to the net force on them. So if you, if you can figure out what the net force is on a, a, a ball, for example, it will, it will, uh, it will accelerate so as, uh, so as, accelerate in the direction of the net force. So forces cause acceleration. Sometimes it's hard to identify all the forces. Things are complicated. You know, which way is this thing gonna fall? You know, which way is it gonna accelerate? It's, it's complicated. So there's another way of looking at, at acceleration, and that is uh, it, looking at the potential energy. Potential energy and forces are not independent things. Potential energies are the energies stored in forces. So potential energy and forces are just, they're, they're, they're thick as thieves. And if you think about the energy, now, I don't know if the bowling ball is committed, I'll do it in a minute. If I, if I do work on this dumbbell, lifting it up, I'm storing my work as potential energy in the dumbbell by doing work against the force of gravity. The dumbbell left to itself will accelerate downward in the direction of the force of gravity, the only important force acting on it, which is also in the direction that will get rid of the gravitational potential energy as quickly as possible. If, the, if you look at all the directions the dumbbell can move, to the right, left, up, more, and all, none of those will reduce its, its gravitational energy uh, at all or, or by much. 
the direction in which it can move that will really reduce its gravitational potential energy quickly is straight down. And there's the connection. An object accelerates in the direction of the net force on it. In this case, if I let go of it, the force of gravity. It also accelerates in the direction that gets rid of its potential energy as quickly as possible. In this case, gravitational potential energy. They go together. The direction of the force is downward. The direction that reduces its gravitational potential energy as quickly as possible is downward. They go together. And they're two equivalent, completely, completely related uh, explanations for why it accelerates downward. Is that OK? There will be times during the class, during the semester, where something's going to accelerate, but it's really hard to figure out what the forces are in it. And torques, too, like, like, the, like the chair on its you know, tip funny. And in those circumstances, we will often throw up our hands at trying to figure out all the forces and torques and just go looking at potential energy. How can this thing move to reduce its potential energy as quickly as possible? And a sort of an example of this is, is a bowling ball. When it's here at the center, it has as little gravitational potential energy as it can have without breaking the string. And um, if I move it to left, right, towards you, away from you, all these possible directions, it will rise. It's right, it's right below the pivot. So if I come over here, you can see it's, it's at this height on me right now. If I come over here, it's higher, right? So it's, it's accumulating potential energy. So which way will it accelerate? It'll always accelerate so as to get rid of that potential energy as quickly as it can. In this case, to, the, to your left. In this case, to your right. You know, it's, it, it's smart. It, it finds whatever, it, it can figure out which direction to go to reduce its total potential energy. Is that okay? This is a general rule. It's useful. It was useful in your problem set, of course, to deal with the bowling alley, but uh, okay. So that brings me to some not super related demonstration, but it's, you know, with the time allotted, I can, you know, I can do it. Okay. If I let this guy swing back and forth, it's rhythmically converting energy between two, two forms. Um, it is converting, this is gravitational, kinetic, gravitational, kinetic, gravitational. So it reaches peak gravitational at the ends of its swing and peak kinetic at the middle of its swing, and it goes back and forth rhythmically about that, that, in that sequence. The energy is not changing because the energy is trapped on board. Why? It can't do work on anything. The only, thing, the only way it connects with the, with the world other than gravity is that that pin up there, and that pin isn't moving, so no work can be done. So this guy, once you put energy into it by doing work on it, it hangs onto that energy for a long time, and it just keeps turning it back and forth between forms. It is able to get rid of momentum easily because it can pull on the top up there for time, and that's easy. It transfers mo momentum. But energy is trapped on board. All right, so the classic demonstration, you've probably seen it before, is you know, do you believe in the conservation of energy? If energy is conserved, then when I let this guy go, without pushing it, uh, it starts with only gravitational. It goes to kinetic, gravitational, kinetic, and back to gravitational. It can't get me because it's only got X amount of energy to get me would need extra energy, as in if I pushed it, or there was an earthquake moving that pin. OK, ready, go. <laughs> yeah. There, this wall over here, they, it, it, it has over the years had dents from people who pushed it. If you push it, what's wrong? You did work on it, right? You added energy to it in the process. All right. So spring scales on Monday, no class Friday.